Riverside Insights is your home for complete insights about your students' potential and performance. Through our industry-leading solutions, the Iowa Assessments, the Cognitive Abilities Test COGAT, and introducing the new Iowa Flex, an online benchmark test tailored to each student's ability level, Riverside Insights continues its tradition of support and partnership with the National Catholic Education Association toward our common goal of elevating the potential of all students. To learn more, visit our booth at NCEA and sign up for our newsletter at RiversideInsights.com for access to our extensive library of professional development webinars, white papers, case studies, blogs, and so much more. Riverside Insights is your trusted partner in Catholic education. Thanks for joining us for Day 2 at NCEA 2021. We're thrilled to bring you our fourth keynote, sponsored by Riverside Insights. Our speaker today comes to us from San Diego State University, where she is Professor of Literacy in the School of Teacher Education. She also serves as the Dean of Academic Affairs at Health Sciences High and Middle College, and is one of the definitive thought leaders in literacy education. Her research and experience have yielded numerous books and articles that have shaped the way young people read, and succeed. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Nancy Fry to NCEA 2021. Hi, I'm Nancy Fry, and I'm here today in San Diego, California, to talk about teacher clarity, in this particular case, in a high flex environment. Now, it may go for you by any number of terms, a hybrid environment, a concurrent or a simultaneous environment, the roomies and the zoomies, the meaties and the seedies. In any case, we know that teacher clarity is a fundamental practice to ensure across any platform that students understand what it is that they're learning and that in fact, they own their learning. And to be sure, this decade's really revolutionary idea in education has been that active student involvement in their own learning is key to obtaining those breakthrough results. We have to ensure that students understand and are actively participating in their own learning. Dan Willingham, who is a scientist in cognitive theory, talks about what it really means to know something and that our shift in our profession is helping students to know that their ability to explain ideas to others, that's what true understanding is, not simply to be passive receivers of when content is explained to them. We need to bump up to elevate what it truly means to be able to know. Let's take a look at kindergartner Sarah as she talks with us about what it is that she knows about her own writing. Sarah, can you tell us how this chart works? We'll point to them and tell us about it. I know. Nobody's on this, but some people might not be on this. Oh, come. Because some people won't do that because we're in kindergarten. But some people might do that. Good. Now go further up the chart and tell us about the middle of it, Sarah, around the orange crayon. Well, some people sound it out and try and make their letters neat on this one. Good. And what about further up the chart, Sarah? Then what happens? On this one, they try to sound it out. They try to make the letters neatly and try to make the thing right. This is where I am. I sound it out. I try to keep them nicely written. I try to make the right words. I try to keep the letters with a space before they start. And I'm going over to here because it's the last step and I'm over at the nine step. This is the 10 step. 
Sarah knows what success looks like. Sarah is able to monitor her progress. She knows where it is that she is in her learning and where it is that she's headed. Teacher clarity helps to helps for students to be able to understand their own learning journey, not simply to wait for information to be able to wash over them in a passive kind of way. And here's the thing about clarity and success. It empowers learners. It gives them the confidence to be able to move their own learning forward, to speed up that rate of learning. We want to be able to use teacher clarity in order to be able to raise our expectations for our students, to raise the rigor of what it is that we're teaching them, and to accelerate their own learning. So in our uh, keynote today, a learning intention for you is learning about teacher clarity, especially the alignment of teacher clarity practices that include learning intentions and success criteria, and how it is that we make sure that we are aligning those so that we can empower learners, so that they can own their own learning. And your success criteria in going forward, you'll know that you're successful in being able to do so when your students can reliably answer three key questions in their own words. What are those three key questions? We'll be getting to that. Let's talk, though, first uh, about the foundation, the research uh, about where this comes from. John Hattie's work in visible learning has really been instrumental in us understanding not only teacher clarity, but in understanding how it is that we can empower learners to shift that ownership of learning so that we have them participating in this learning fight that we have. And he works with a statistical tool that's referred to as an effect size. An effect size, without getting too mathematical about all of it. And effect size measures the magnitude of something, the power of something to be able to create change. It's a bit different than just attributing something as being statistically significant. Rather, we want to know how big of a change can we get? How much bang can we get for our buck? And a way of thinking about this is to equate this with the way it is that we measure the power of earthquakes. As I said, I'm here in California. We have about 10,000 earthquakes uh, in any given year. And the way that those are measured and reported is through a Richter scale. A Richter scale measures effect size. It measures magnitude. There are some earthquakes that happen that we never feel at all. What we are really interested in though, are those educational earthquakes, if you will, that really deliver a high effect size, that create a lot of change, that are powerful change agents in what it is that we do. Let's translate that a bit further. Those items that fall into that blue zone, those influences that fall into that blue zone, those are those educational earthquakes that you feel, those educational earthquakes that have the potential to be able to accelerate learning. If the 0 0.40 level is about a year's worth of growth for a year in school, then as we fall into that blue zone, we're picking up speed along the way. Teacher clarity is one of those influences that has the potential to nearly double the speed of learning. If 0 0.40 is about a year's worth of growth, then we're approaching the 0 0.80 level, doubling the speed of learning. Now, teacher clarity is more than learning intentions and success criteria. My remarks this morning are going to be uh, mostly uh, around learning intentions and success criteria, but it's important to acknowledge that teacher clarity is actually an umbrella term that encompasses a number of different practices. 
And those practices include clarity of organization. How are the lessons actually linked up with those stated learning intentions and success criteria? How about the clarity of explanation? Is that information uh, relevant, accurate, and comprehensible to students. The clarity of the examples and that guided practice that go along with it, and especially the clarity of assessment in student learning, that what we assess is aligned with what it is that we have taught which is aligned with what it is that we have stated are the learning intentions and the success criteria. And each of these four are in and of themselves powerful drivers in being able to accelerate learning. For example, when it comes to organizing instruction, look at the effect size for that, the potential to speed the rate of learning. For explaining content, making sure that that content is accurate and relevant, a nice bump in learning that happens there. Here's another uh, one of those elements, giving those examples, providing that guided practice also speeds the rate of learning. And finally, how it is that we utilize assessment can speed the rate of learning. Now, important to note, and just as a pause here, that those things alone, if they are not aligned with one another, are not going to deliver these breakthrough results. It is the alignment of all of these practices that matters, that makes a difference, and that encourages students to be able to own their own learning because they know what it is that they are going to be learning about. It speeds up the rate of learning. Now, in the success criteria that I laid out a few minutes ago, I talked about three essential questions that are useful from a teacher standpoint to be able to understand if, in fact, we are teaching with clarity. And here are those three questions. What am I learning today? Why am I learning this? How will I know that I have learned it? These three questions are what learners of any age, whether you are six years old or 46 years old, any learner is asking himself or herself these questions. What is it that I'm learning about today? And why is it that I should be learning this? How will I know that I've actually learned it? What we want to do is surface those questions, to make those questions part and parcel of what it is that we teach and how it is that students learn. And the way that we accomplish that are through some fundamental practices. What am I learning today? The question of learners. We address that through the use of learning intentions. Why am I learning this? That's the relevance piece making sure that students know that learning is not just a low level set of compliance tasks, but rather that it contributes to the quality of their lives about how it is that they understand themselves, how it is that they understand the world. And then that third question, how will I know that I've learned it? That's the question that really speeds up the rate of learning. That's the success criteria. Think about this. When you go for a drive and you are uh, setting out on a journey of one kind or another, if you know what your destination is, you will be able to drive there more confidently, more efficiently, because you know exactly where it is that you're headed. Success criteria work in exactly that same way. They set out the destination for learners. How will you know that you've learned this? Here's the success criteria that goes along with it. Now, sometimes in that navigation system, we need some of that turn by turn that happens along the way. Here's where your learning intentions come into play. How will I know that I am moving towards my destination? Those turn by turns, the learning intentions help us to maintain that confidence that we're actually headed in the right direction for our destination. 
Now, these get articulated in a number of different ways. Here's one example here about how it is to link up learning intentions with relevance and with success criteria. Remember, this is about the alignment between all of those. This from a geography class. We are learning where we live in the universe. That's the learning intention. Why? So we know where we are and where we could go. That's the relevance. I'll know I um, I'll know I know it when I can explain exactly where it is that I live. That's the success criteria. And you may notice in looking further down that what the teacher has laid out are what it is that students are learning about. This is a unit of instruction that's going on. They're learning about the planet that they live on. They're learning about the continent that they live on. And you can see where it is that this is headed. They're going to be learning about the country, the state, the city, and then finally right down to their local uh, uh, context, where it is that they are right now. Think of Sarah knowing what her destination is, where it is that she's headed. That's one example of being able to align all of those. Now, in a high flex environment, all of us have gotten much more adept at being able to use a variety of technology tools at the school with a high school where uh, my colleague Doug Fisher and I teach. Uh, we've been utilizing more and more flip grids for students to be able to answer those three questions. This is Elijah, a 10th grade student in a U.S. history class, answering those three questions. Hello. Today, we learned about the Gilded Age, which was a time of fast economic growth. We're learning about the Gilded Age because it was a crucial part of American history where we start to make our own commodities and take in many immigrants. I know I learned something because I can define urbanization and explain the inequalities faced by immigrants, like how they were forced into poverty and inhumane living spaces. There are several things that I like uh, about that. First of all, let's take the learner side of it. Let's take uh, Elijah's side of it. Elijah is organizing that information. You can see that he has prepared some notes in advance so that he can uh, be able to explain what his thinking is, what it is that he knows about his learning so far. And that organization requires him to be able to retrieve information. We know that retrieval is an essential part of learning, especially when you're learning new content. That's really important that they get lots of opportunities to retrieve, to pull ideas back out of their brain in order to be able to explain what it is that they are learning about. Now, from the teacher side of it, we utilize this practice across the week so that each day there are a segment of students who are supplying this flip grid for their teacher. And these are typically a minute long or so. So over the course of the week, each day, approximately 20% of the students are assigned to be able to do this. This gives the teacher a great way to be able to gauge whether in fact he or she is teaching with clarity or whether we need to make some adjustments along the way. Remember, students are the ones who actually decide whether we are teaching with clarity. It's not up to us alone. We have to listen to our students, listen to their explanations about what it is that they believe that they're learning, what it is that they believe uh, the reason is for that learning, and how it is that they believe they will know that they are successful. These are all essential practices that help to speed the rate of learning. And by the way, to make us more efficient in the instruction that we are able to offer. So let's dive down just a little bit deeper and let's take a look at learning intentions uh, and learning intentions. You know, I always think about as, as I look at an illustration like this, what the play is. It, those are those statements of what it is that we want students to be able to learn. 
and they need to be communicated consistently. They need uh, to also encompass sometimes the knowledge that they're learning. Other times it might be the skills that they're learning about or the concepts that they're learning about. But it begins to set forth a path for students to be able to move along. Learning intentions are not tasks. They are not agendas of what it is that students will be doing, but rather what it is that they're actually going to be learning about. And learning intentions communicate what your expectations are. I think about, for example, the work that we did with a large elementary school district here in Southern California. And as the as the, the uh, uh, district began to be able to adopt learning intentions in particular, and as school leaders began to do those very important learning walks with their instructional leadership team, what they found were that some of the expectations for students were actually well below grade level, that they consistently were encountering learning intentions for fourth graders, for example, that were really more appropriate for second graders or third graders. Learning intentions can be a way to be able to articulate what our expectations are. It's a way for us as a field, as a group, as a department, as a grade level to be able to gauge what our expectations are for our students and to ensure that we've got that right level of rigor that's available for them. Those learning intentions also help to drive the assessment that is happening. Those formative assessments are an important part of that. Again, I'll go back to a major idea that I introduced earlier, that it is about the alignment of these practices, not just these practices in isolation. When you're articulating what those learning intentions are, you are providing for yourself insight into potentially what it is that you'll be assessing formatively, checking for understanding in order to gauge whether, in fact, students are where they need to be on that learning journey. So as an example, here are three potential learning uh, intentions and let's think about what it was that we might assess. So if we're, our learning intention is about content, for example, and we're multiplying and estimating products of fractions, then that, in fact, is what it is that my checking for understanding should be about. I should be paying attention to that. The content is often the, um, the most direct way for teachers to be able to engage and practice with learning intentions. But sometimes the, what, what it is that we're teaching is not about content, but rather it's about skills. In other words, how will you express that content purpose? So on a different day, our language purpose might be to use mathematical terminology. Now, as a teacher, if that's my learning intention on a particular day, then my assessment, my formative assessment, my checking for understanding shifts as well. I want to be listening for the use of mathematical terminology. Let's say on a third day that one of the areas of emphasis is really around those social and emotional skills that are so important. For instance, we might be working on taking, um, improving our turn-taking skills. Again, that then informs what my assessment is going to be. In this particular case, the way it is that I want to be able to check for understanding is to pay close attention to those turn-taking skills, alignment of those learning intentions and those assessments, those checks for understanding are important for us to be able to create feedback for students about their progress on that journey. Now, let's take a look at a second element 
of that, which is that success criteria. How do you know what your destination is going to be? And success criteria are particularly powerful in being able to speed up the rate of learning. There's high potential here. Remember, this is always about potential. There's high potential here to speed the rate of learning with the regular use of success criteria. And always keeping in mind that it's students that let us know if we are teaching with clarity. Now, success criteria are so important, so powerful for a number of reasons. And I'd like for you to consider the metacognitive skills and the self-regulation skills that you are teaching to young people. When success criteria are in place and are utilized by students, that's a key part of this, when they are utilized by students, they contribute to the metacognitive and self-regulation skills, especially because students who are able to use them are more likely to be able to plan and predict their learning. They're more able to set goals for themselves. They can accurately judge their own progress. They have a better sense of what it is that's expected from them, and they feel emotionally and psychologically safe. That's an important part of how it is that we create that classroom climate as being a place for learners. Again, I'll reference you back to that video uh, that I started out with, with Sarah. Sarah has all of these behaviors clearly in place during that time where she's explaining her own learning journey. There are a number of ways that we can establish success criteria. The use of rubrics, for example, are one way to be able to articulate to students what it is that success actually looks like. Think about some of the favorite rubrics that you have and that column that articulates what proficiency looks like, that's your success criteria right there. That's your success criteria. The level of proficiency articulates your success criteria. Other teachers very often will use things like I can statements. I can statements are very popular to be able to use for students. And there's some cognitive restructuring that goes on with using I can statements. What they help the learner to do is to visualize a positive future. I can do this, even though it might not be at this moment, I will be able to do this. Call it growth mindset. Call it grit and perseverance. Those I can statements can help to do the cognitive restructuring that we want students to do in order to be able to enact those important learning dispositions. Another way of doing so is by using exemplars, student work exemplars. Uh, my, uh, uh, many of us as teachers have examples of previous student work, and I encourage you to use those, but I also encourage you it, whenever you're using exemplars to be able to uh, keep those uh, almost but not quite uh, examples as well, not just examples that are stellar, but examples that are close. Because then what you're able to do is you're able to have conversations with students and to be able to say to them, how might we advise this learner to be able to increase the quality of her work? What might we advise her to be able to do? And then finally, through the use of modeling and demonstration, very often the way that we articulate what it is that success looks like, especially is to be able to model and to be able to demonstrate what it is that students are doing. So in teaching that success criteria, negotiation is an important part of this. And I don't mean negotiation in terms of uh, trying to kind of figure out at the bargaining table uh, about what it is that students do, but rather it's really about co-construction. 
If we have a project, for example, that we're going to be engaging in, let's have that conversation with students. What would we expect to be able to see in a successful piece of work to co-construct that success criteria? Again, the idea is to be able to increase the amount of student ownership of learning. Another way to be able to do this is to be able to model, to be able to demonstrate, to be able to say, here's what I mean, and to think aloud with students about a piece of work, what it is that you're noticing along the way. Help them, especially, and I'll use as one example, a writing assignment, and think aloud with them around that writing assignment. Perhaps it is parsing what that writing prompt is going to be. Let's take it apart, take it apart in front of them so that they have a better sense of what it is that success looks like and sounds like. And a third way of doing this, as I noted earlier, is to use exemplars. And those exemplars that are the close but not quite are incredibly valuable in being able to have these conversations. Asking students, inviting students, for example, to make judgments on their own. How about these two pieces of work? Which one best meets the criteria? And how might we advise that other person about how it is that he or she could increase the quality of that work. Now, of course, when you're using exemplars, you are not using exemplars from current students, but think about the assignments that you have saved in the past. Make sure, of course, that we are protecting student identity, but use those exemplars to be able to show them what success looks like. And those success criteria should always be more than just wall art. They are more than just posting them on the board or posting them on the learning management system. We want them to be an active part of the learning that students do. So for example, you can drop those into uh, their notebooks. If your students are using notebooks, have that success criteria right in there for them and encourage the kind of self-assessment. How are we, I, How am I doing on this work? How am I monitoring my progress toward my final destination? Utilize them as self-assessment tools. Here's an example from a middle school science unit. And what you'll note in particular is that, yes, the tasks are outlined there. The learning intentions all the way over on the left-hand column. The tasks and the assessments in the second column. The success criteria in the third column. Do you see the alignment that is happening there. And then finally, over there in that last column, inviting students to be able to self-assess. Before we start the unit of instruction, where am I at in this success criteria? What is it that I already know? One of the very most effective ways to be able to teach new content is to link it to prior knowledge. Going from the known to the new is a fundamental in teaching and learning. This helps to be able to activate their prior knowledge in advance of instruction. And then over the course of the week, having students go back to that self-assessment again. How am I doing now that I've had this unit of instruction? Where am I at in the, that success criteria? We can utilize these in terms of self-ranking. These are incredibly valuable when it comes to uh, us getting feedback as teachers. For example, here's a seventh grade unit. And again, in advance of the unit, inviting students to be able to rank from easiest, number one, to the most difficult, number five, where it is that they predict will be less challenging and more challenging for them. This is incredibly valuable information for us as teachers to be able to know in advance of instruction where it is that we can speed up and where it is that we need to slow down.
I can statements, as I said, are incredibly useful as well. Very popular for teachers to be able to articulate those. But let's even increase the usefulness of that. Let's turn those I can statements into opportunities for students to self-question, to self-reflect, an important metacognitive skill. Turn those I can statements into can I questions. Can I tell the order of events in this story? Or can I explain charts, graphs, and diagrams in this informational text? Or can I compare new information that I read to what it is that I already know? Or can I write about what it is that I've read? Encourage that habit of self-questioning for students. Another way to be able to encourage that self-questioning is before the lesson or at the beginning of the lesson to pose one of those questions. I've got four that are listed there. Um, pose one of those questions. Why is this topic important? I've introduced to you the learning intentions and the success criteria. Why is this topic important? Or what do you expect is going to be easy about today's lesson and what will be hard? After the lesson, that exit ticket at the end of the lesson, what new knowledge did you acquire today? Or perhaps on a different day, what strategy worked best for you? And why did it work best for you? We use uh, digital interactive notebooks regularly. Certainly, this has been a newer practice that I have learned about over the past year. And quite frankly, I can't imagine ever going back and using those paper notebooks again. Those digital notebooks in particular are really just collaborative slides, Google Slides, that uh, we prepare for students. And you can drop right into there your success criteria at the beginning of every unit of instruction and then encourage students to be able to monitor their own learning along the way. Because they are digital, you can take a look at their progress in their notebooks and how it is that they are gauging their own learning as well. To be sure, learning intentions and success criteria are two important tent poles in teacher clarity. But teacher clarity also includes the ways that we organize our instruction, especially through alignment, making sure that the learning intentions, the success criteria, and the tasks are aligned well with each other, and in how it is that we use assessment, not only assessment for ourselves as we check for understanding, but also by encouraging students to self-assess. That's the secret of being able to get students to be able to own their own learning. We'll turn to Bob Marzano as a final thought on this around learning intentions and success criteria and learning from what doesn't work. Here's what doesn't work. What doesn't work is writing them on the board or the learning management system and then assuming that students are going to pay attention to them. What doesn't work is confusing those learning intentions with the tasks, with the instructional activities that you have students doing. We're not learning to be able to complete a math worksheet. We're learning about some form of mathematical knowledge. That worksheet that they're completing is a task that is aligned with that mathematical work that they're doing. And what doesn't work is simply writing instructional objectives that are much too broad. We want to be able to get down to a grain size that is useful for students. The one thing that does work is having them translate what it is that they're learning about, why it is that they're learning it, and how it is that they will know that they've learned it into their own words. And that, you'll recall, was our success criteria for today in going forward, checking in with your students about how they know about what they're learning and why they're learning it and how they'll know that they're successful will signal to you that in fact, you're teaching with clarity.
And with that, a final reminder in this very unsteady year to make sure that you breathe, make sure that you take care of yourself. We have learned so much as a field in education this year. Let's make sure that we're keeping that going forward. I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today, and I hope that you get Uh, such enjoyment out of your conference today and over the next few days. Thank you again. Dr. Fry, what a joy to have you here with us at NCEA 2021. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your inspiration. You know, as we continue throughout the rest of our day, don't forget to check out our virtual exhibit hall, check your progress on our leaderboards and contests, and make new connections. Thanks for joining us for this keynote address. We'll see you soon.